This is Abnormal Entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen of the internet. This is Steve Cruz. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Come in. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Come in. Come in. Mr. Stevie Wonder. It's the year of living Stevie. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Come in. Hey everybody, welcome back. It's the Year of Living Stevie. I'm your host, Daryl Bean. Hey, it's been a while. I've missed you guys. Uh, no real reason. I just, you know, kind of uh, after the, the Stevie party, kind of put it on a hiatus for a while, but I realized I had unfinished business. I had things I had to do. Got a great show for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking to the legendary, the wonderful, the fantastic, if you don't know who he is, Take a minute and go look him up and let your mind be blown by the great Greg Fillingaines, who's possibly the most recorded keyboardist in history, uh, former music director for Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson, and appeared on many of uh, Michael Jackson's, you know, on Thriller and Bad, and I think he's on Off the Wall, uh, playing Rhodes on Cheese Out of My Life and, and all those kind of great things. Just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of recordings. I'm sure that his keyboard playing is featured on over a billion selling uh, different projects that he's on. I don't know what I'm trying to say. All I'm trying to say is the guy is amazing, and he's got some great stories about his time working with Stevie Wonder and about his career. So uh, we got that coming up really, really soon. What have I been up to? Um, geez, I don't know. I have been doing stand-up for about a year now, and that's been a lot of fun, a real adventure, uh, and uh, just, you know, kind of doing the thing, you know, making life happen, uh, and uh, I just, you know, I kind of realized, I, th- I thought I was kind of done with the podcast, and we had the big party, which was a lot of fun, we had a great time with that, and I don't know, the beast was stirring, There's, I just realized there was some unfinished business here in the year of living Stevie land. Uh, so here I am and I'm back and I'm glad that you're here with me and listening and checking it out. So, uh, so yeah, without any further ado, I kind of want to get to the interview. So this is Greg Fillingaines, my conversation with Greg Fillingaines via Skype from his home in California. No, I believe you're the one with the questions. Uh, I am the one with the questions. That's true. <laughs> so, uh, so I guess to start out with, uh, let's just talk a little bit about you, your beginnings. So you were born in Detroit. I was born in Detroit 62 years ago. So, um, and you went to Cast Tech, right? I did. Oh, you did your homework. Were you were you pretty heavily involved in the music program there? Because it did. I'm, you know, that is kind of like a, a hot house during that time period. Yeah, there was a uh, there was um, a class called um, it's a jazz ensemble that I was part of, mm-hmm. and I believe I was in the choral the choral um, class too. I think I was in one more. Uh, music uh class other than um in the jazz ensemble but uh, that was a big deal mm-hmm. yeah, and it definitely helped to uh uh shape me as a, a jazz musician and gave me an appreciation for it and uh, you know the ability to just play with other kids and learn mm-hmm. uh, as a matter of fact one of those kids was jerry allen um, oh wow yeah and uh you know, she was wonderful, and and there were other guys who started out playing, and and uh, you know ended up branching off into you know other areas uh, as entrepreneurs. But it was it was great fun. And then um, there was uh, uh, a, also another guy there who was the biggest influence on me as far as uh, my development in jazz. And his name is Kamal Kenyatta. And uh, he's a sax player and, and keyboards. And he would literally, I would go to his house, man, and we'd go to his bedroom upstairs and just sit and listen to everybody for hours. Oh, wow. And he would break it down. You know, he'd break down the differences, uh, you know, in uh, drummers versus, uh, you know, horn players versus sax players, you know, mm-hmm. uh, Coltrane, uh Wayne Shorter, everybody, you know, just everybody. Just listen to everybody. Uh, and uh, 
it was just an invaluable uh, experience. You know? How old were you when that was happening? Was that like early seventies, late sixties? No, it was. Uh, it was. Yeah, early seventies. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Early to mid seventies. That's that's. What I, I one question. I you know I've listened to a few interviews, and you've you've talked about the influence of uh, Misha Kotler, I believe. Is that right? From the Detroit Symphony. That is also correct, my good. Um, and and the the influence that Misha had on your technique. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. how much. Um, have you done a lot of classical playing or done any classical playing since that time? Because people mostly know you as a pop keyboard player and jazz keyboard player. But I know I was wondering if you kept up on your classical chops at all. Not so much. Not so much. In, in very tiny spurts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, a there's a, uh, there's a record that Quincy did on Donna Summer. Mm-hmm. And one of the songs is called Mystery of Love, I believe. Okay. And um, uh, he, Quincy uh, allowed me to be featured playing the opening of a, of a Bach. Um, I believe it's a Bach partita, and it was in C minor. Because I used, I used to always mess around and play that. And he said, right, that should be the intro. And like, uh, so I played that as the intro, and it's also in the song too. So it's just kind of cool. And no copyright to worry about. So that's kind of nice, you know. Yeah, that was a relief there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. I, one thing I was wondering about um, is having grown up in Detroit um, and being involved in jazz. How much going to places like like Baker's Keyboard Lounge or Cliff Bell's? I'm and I'm not from Detroit originally. I'm from Pennsylvania, so I'm I'm sort of yeah. like learning this stuff as I've lived here, but I've lived here for like 20 years. So, um, so I've had some time to pick up on it, but w were you as a teenager, like going out to those kind of places and, and hearing people play or I, like what, what else? A little bit, a little bit. I, I didn't do it a lot. I did it a bit. And Baker's was the hub. Um, I remember seeing uh chick at Baker's. Really? Yeah. Um, that's a, a, a random memory, but I do remember it. Um, but I also remember um, lying to my mom, saying that I was going to go to a friend's, and I ended up uh, taking her car and driving to University of Michigan to see weather. <laughs> oh wow! Was that would that have been in uh, Hill Auditorium or, or something like that? Was, it was just... in some auditorium, but man, it was it was cra it was otherworldly, man. They were, they were like rock stars. It was crazy. Wow, that would have been amazing. You no, know, it was like the jazz equivalent of Earth, Wind, and Fire. It was crazy, man. <laughs> it's like, it just had that effect on me. You know, I just remember that effect and seeing them. They were like these, these fusion gods, man. It was crazy, just fantastic. I was, I was really lucky. I mean, this is your interview, so my input is it's not that big. But um, growing up in in Pennsylvania, I grew up in Erie, which is up in yeah. the corner and even for being kind of a smallish city the people that would come through like i saw james carter um i saw chick also um at a local university and they were touring to sort of like test material for a new album which i didn't know at the time but we saw them and it was amazing and then like a year later this record comes out and i bought it and i was like wait a minute that's what they played at this university holy cow you know so it was pretty amazing yeah to see that so yeah it's, it's it's really crazy how those kind of things sort of end up influencing you as a musician well who were who are some of your favorite players uh in that time period well i mean please outside of steve um <laughs> the, the standard was herbie mm -hmm. and uh chick um i also remember listening to lee morgan's sidewinder when i was a kid ah yeah yeah like I listened to that as much as I listened to the Beatles. You know, 
That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so in, in pop music too. So I, yeah, in other interviews, you'd mentioned a little bit about how much you loved the Beatles and, and some of the pop music that was, was going on at that time. Did you play in any, any like pop bands or was that? Yeah, no, I had, I was in a couple of different bands and we played mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. We played stuff from Rufus and Shaka Khan. We played, um, you know, Grover Washington Jr. Uh, we played, oh, we played everything, and that was the beauty of uh, growing up in Detroit because I listened to everything because it was all available. I listened to hard R and B soul stations like WJLB. I listened to the the mega pop stations like WKNR, Keener Radio, and CKLW, which was across the river in Windsor. And, oh, CKLW was powerful, man, because not only did they play everything. They had these fantastic uh, promotions, and they just they they were just so inspiring. Like, um, for instance, I remember when Elton uh, came to that station, and they actually ran a thing for uh, a day or two. He was EJ the DJ, mm-hmm. and he came and spun records like for the, for the whole a day and it was it was cr- and then they would have these annual every during christmas they'd have these annual um promotions called um uh oh what was it called shoot make a uh, something like make a wish kind of thing and people okay. would call and you know give their their wishes and their desires and like a lot of times they would grant them and I always was, I always wondered, man, what would it be like if I could call in and they grant me my, oh, Christmas wish. It was called Christmas wish. <laughs> and, you know, I love that. And, uh, but I listened to every, and, you know, uh, between Motown, which was, uh, you know, its own industry and sure. then, uh, the Memphis sound and, uh, you know, the British invasion and the California sound with the Beach Boys and the Mamas and the Papas. I listened to everything, all of it. All of it, man. Creedence Clearwater Revival, the Monkees, you know, because uh, first there was the Beatles, which inspired me when I saw them on Sullivan uh, when I was eight. And then we had the Monkees, which were the American Beatles, and I went crazy about that. And then we had the Jackson Five, which were the Black Beatles, and I went crazy about that. <laughs> so it was just... Yeah. yeah, I was thinking that like when growing up in Detroit, really in the heyday of Motown, yeah. that must have been crazy. I can't even imagine what that would be like. It was fantastic, and I absorbed it all. The only drag is that I I never went to a, a Motown review at the Fox Theater. Uh, I was kind of too young. Uh, well, I don't know if I was too young. It's just my mind. I didn't get to go. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, man, it was a uh, please, man, Marvin and. The Four Tops and The Temptations, my goodness, and Stevie and uh, Smokey and The Miracles and uh, The Marvelettes. And it just it just kept going. Everybody was just so on fire. Aretha, please. And she wasn't on Motown, but, you know, she, right. uh, she was Detroit, you know, so. Yeah, I just it's in being just that all being around, and then the the musicians from the Funk Brothers too, um, all just like around yeah. like being yeah. able to see see basically the Funk Brothers play at Baker's by themselves without the singers. It's you know just being in that kind of environment. I just can't yeah. imagine, and it's you know I'm sure that that just you just soaked that up. You know? I soaked it all up, but then I was also in the Detroit Youth Symphony Orchestra. Ah, that's back when we had money for music. You know, not only did we have the the main symphony, we had the Detroit Youth Symphony, and I was the cellist player in the Detroit uh, Symphony Orchestra. I was going to ask you probably have a, a couple of Nutcrackers underneath your belt. <laughs> dun, well, dun, dun, oh, dun. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it was a great time. I remember taking the bus uh, from my house and going downtown to Ford Auditorium to rehearse. Mm-hmm. But the, it was wonderful. That's Hetty. Who is, um, who is just for my own sort of nerdiness, who was conducting the Youth Symphony back then? Was anybody notable that as a conductor or? No, but I, I, it was a black guy and I believe his first name was Paul and I can't remember his last name. You just, <laughs> just hit me. Um, cause I was afraid you were going to ask me that in the, <laughs> and, yeah, thank you, my Daryl. But, um, yeah, uh, Paul, 
can't remember his last name, but he had a very distinctive look, you know. Of course, conductor. I mean, you know, yeah, you know, have the thing going for you there. <laughs> yeah, uh, that 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 character in the Warner Brothers uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon that had the tails and, and the hair. <laughs> like, and then you end up he, he was like, he was like the black. He was the black version of that. That's amazing. Um, so to fast forward a little bit, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about your time with Stevie. Um, so when I was telling people, I was really excited when I when you'd agreed for, to let me interview you. And I'm like, I'm going to talk to Greg Philigates. And people, you know, being a studio musician, I'm sure you get this a lot, went like, well, who's that? And I'm like, what do you mean who's that? He's played on everything. Um, hey man, and I, listen, I, I, don't, I don't have any illusions of grandeur. You know, those that know me know me and those that don't. Uh, find out, I guess. That's that's kind of it. Um, so one thing I thought of, and maybe this isn't something you ever even really thought of, because it would be uh, kind of terrifying in a way to think about. Like, how many, given the fact that you've played on albums like Thriller, which have sold forty million or whatever you know number of albums there are, um, how many how many albums as far as like sales do you do you think you have played on at this point? Daryl, I don't know. I just wish. <laughs> I just wish, I just wish some of it reflected in my bank account. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things you've mentioned. I, I watched a couple of interviews that you've done. Like, there was one with uh, Mitch at uh, Sweetwater, um, and then there was another one with a drummer. I can't remember. It's like uh, In Session, I think, was the name of the series. Or oh something. yeah. yeah. Um, and you talked about some of the difficulties, some of the financial difficulties of being um, even an elite studio player now given how the music industry is is you know a lot of people would politely say changed some other people not so politely would say fallen apart in a lot of ways yeah, but it, i i say what music industry <laughs> it's kind of true it's kind of true what um in recent years um how are some some ways how are some ways what are some ways that you've used to sort of creatively get around that lack of studio income that you might have had in the 70s and 80s well yeah i mean that that's long gone so i've had to diversify i've had to and i've i've uh, stretched as a music director and uh, <laughs> done a lot of tv shows which i absolutely love doing and i've also worked on live events and uh just trying to branch out in uh in different creative ways it's, it's always uh a challenge. It's always interesting, uh, but uh, th those are some of the ways. Anyway, um, I had a, a friend of mine who's a, a keyboardist who asked her, "What skills do you feel the young musicians should be working on if that's something they're interested in doing in the future?" Uh, learn how to be uh, a really solid and reliable follower, because mm -hmm. you can't be a good leader until you're a good follower. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Uh, uh, you know, do all the fundamental things that will keep you working, like being on time, mm -hmm. uh, like um, uh, being adaptable and flexible, um, having a good attitude. Because a musician with a great attitude will always be hired more than a, a more talented musician uh, with issues. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's. I remember getting that piece of advice from uh, my teacher in high school. I, that was one of the things he told me when I was probably fifteen or sixteen. He's like, "You want to, you want to work, keep your mouth shut, play your butt off, and always say thank you." Those the three things he told me. Like, don't trash people. Be, you know, be a good listener. Yeah. And yeah. All that sort of stuff. And it's that's been the best piece of advice I've ever gotten. Then, as you get into it, you know, you're going to have to learn how to manage different personalities, mm -hmm. and. and um, having uh you know it, it's all a learning curve you know uh, mm -hmm. knowing knowing when to uh, be more forceful or more persuasive and learning when to allow people to figure things out for themselves there's a lot of intangibles that mm -hmm. come along with it but it's basically uh managing different personalities so it's like 90 percent psychology mm -hmm you know, and 10% music and, you know, uh, organization helps. Preparation definitely helps. Yeah. Um, a lot of things, but it can be great fun. It can be terrifying. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's, it's thrilling. It's a, 
it's everything. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I just did a uh, tribute to Quincy that's going to air next month on BET and VH1. And um, I loved every second of the process, man. But, you know, we, we had a nice eight piece horn section uh, with guys like Tom Scott and oh, wow. Chuck Finley and Gene Cipriani. I mean, please, man. Top um, lines. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I had a stellar rhythm section with guys like JR, you know, my old buddy JR and drums mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, Paul Jackson Jr. and Dave DeLome and, uh, you know, just wonderful musicians that, that made this a, 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 another joy, um, you know, to participate in and, and just something else to hopefully make Quincy proud, you know? That's, yeah, I, I can't imagine. I mean, Quincy, obviously, being Quincy, to be able to do that for him and, you know, and to work with him and stuff. It's just, you know, he's such an amazing person and personality um, that I, you know, it's just, that's fantastic. So, um, so rolling back a little bit um, to the beginning of your involvement with Stevie. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned is that Stevie was very influential on your keyboard playing. And then in a couple of interviews, you had said that one of the reasons why Stevie hired you into Wonder Love is because you sounded like him, that you played like him. How, tell me a little bit about how that came to be. Like what records of Stevie's do you remember being a, a, an influence on you as a young musician that kind of led you to that? Uh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. Yeah. Um, everything he did i mean you know please and even his covers i mean check out the intro to we can work it out who does oh, that oh, i love that song oh my god yeah, it's who so- does that Oh, man, who does that? Uh, that's we can work it out from the Beatles. Who does? Who has the balls to do that? Right. <laughs> yeah, that um, I the first time I heard that, I'm like, what is that? that exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what I said. And then, uh, uh, you know, I mean, signs still delivered, and there's not not a lot of keyboard stuff in there. It's it's, it's uh, mainly off of an electric sitar, but mm-hmm. just the whole concept, you know, and. Um, and then uh, later years, when he started uh, branching off into electric uh, keyboards, you know, and, and really getting into the clavinet and other synthesizers, and you hear that, of course, with uh, We Can Work It Out, but then, uh, you know, the Where I'm Coming From album, which was the precursor to the uh, the Fabulous Five. Right. And what I yeah. mean by that, the Fabulous mm-hmm. Five was the f- five... Oh, album. music in my mind, and well, the five the five great albums where every song was great. Yep. So that's music in my mind, um, inner visions, talking book, fulfilling this first finale, and and songs in the key of life. Right. Yeah. And so uh, you know, uh, when I was listening to things like "You Are the Sunset of My Life," I mean, you know, just his approach was so different, um, and. Um, you know, all that. And so, so that was actually one of the songs, uh, You Are the Sunshine, was actually one of the songs that I played for my audition tape. Oh, wow. Uh, and um, uh, you know the story of that, right? Do I have to tell it again? The, about the audition tape that um, a, a famous drummer who is Ricky Lawson yeah. to, get to audition, uh, when he auditioned for Stevie and, and then he heard the tape and then like get to New York now. That you know that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the basic gist of it. So he, uh, Ricky, insisted that I play some things, and and so, um, you are the sunshine was one of those things, mm-hmm. because I wanted to, you know, try to find something that would let him know that I kind of know, I kind of know how he thinks. I kind of, you know, can, uh, you know, approach the keyboard like he does. Mm-hmm in my own humble way. And I, I guess that worked. 
What else, if you don't mind me asking, do you remember what else was on that tape? Another song was uh, Sun Goddess, which was pos- pop- popular at the time. Mm-hmm. And there might have been, there was probably one more, but I can't remember what it was. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, so, see, so the tape, the whole thing with the, you know, with getting called to New York to meet Stevie, you told that story a little bit, but but it'd be kind of nice to maybe revisit it a little bit for the people that are listening to the podcast, especially people that have never, that never have or probably never will meet Stevie Wonder. Like, I, I saw him just a couple nights ago in Windsor, actually did a concert in Windsor, mm-hmm. um, and it was just like, even being you know, 50 feet or 100 feet away from him was kind of magical in a way. It's just his presence and being there. So I can't imagine being in the room. He sort of got that effect on people. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, here, okay, so the front story is that uh, Ricky was asked to um, audition uh, on drums in New York. And the night before he left, I went to visit him, and that's when he insisted that I put some things on a cassette tape, and he promised he'd deliver it to Steve. That's the kind of friend he was. Sure, yeah. So he goes to New York, and some time passes. I can't remember how long, but it felt like weeks. But then one morning, Ricky called me and said, Stevie wants to see you in New York today. And you're like, uh, okay. So I'm like <laughs> running around like a banshee and I'm getting my clothes together. And, uh, you know, my mom's like, what is the matter with you? I'm like, Stevie wants to be in New York. So um, I, I go to New York. On the way to the airport, I am, I am instructed to stop by Stevie's house and pick up one of his brothers. See, okay, that's, yeah, that's a part of the story where I'm going to have to hit the pause button to hear more a little bit about so that. So now I get to go inside Stevie's house, and I, I knew where he lived. Where did he, there, where did there, he live back in the day? Uh, it was a street called Cherry Lawn. Okay. And, um, you know, and it was just this house, you know, and, and uh, it wasn't like a huge spread, but it was this house. And so now I'm like ringing the doorbell to his house. Mm-hmm. And next thing I know, like I'm sitting inside his house. And I'm, I remember sitting there thinking, okay, I'm in Stevie Wonder's house. All right, I'm just. <laughs> what life is this? I'm going to try to soak this all in now. I'm sitting inside <laughs> Stevie Wonder's house, waiting on his brother, one of his brothers, to go to the airport. And so uh, Timothy and I uh, went to the airport and flew to New York and got settled at the hotel. And went to the original Hit Factory studio where I'm sitting on pins and needles, trying to be cool, waiting, 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 you know, making small talk with with the engineer. And all of a sudden, the elevator door opens up and out he ambles, you know, being led by his sister, Renee. Mm -hmm. And they said, Stevie, the kid's here. And so uh, he extended his hand and said, hey, how you doing? And that single handshake uh, was the beginning of... uh, the uh, this massive change in my life life changing experience so so then um we uh you know we hung out had small talk and he showed me uh, a song that he was working on wanted to see if i could learn it and i i guess i stumbled my way through that <laughs> and then the uh next day was more of the formal audition with wonder love and i went there and it was between me and this other white guy, um, who I learned years and years later was sent by Chick. Ah! <laughs> Is it anybody that you that we would recognize? Like maybe we know now, or? Oh, but but you know what? Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! I saw him some years ago at a Nam show, and he came. <laughs> me and said, hey, Greg, you may not remember this, but I'm the guy that auditioned against you for Wonder Love. <laughs> and I dropped to the floor, and his name is Mike Garson. Oh, yeah, with Bowie. Yeah, the guy played yeah. with Bowie. Mike Garson, man. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And we took <laughs> pictures together, and one of the pictures I took was me choking him. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he's a lovely guy, Mike Garson, and so and he told me that Chicory has sent him. It's uh-huh. like, and I was blown away. So, um, so that guy, and uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there, and I'm trying to be cool, you know. But 
And and every once in a while, like certain band members would come up to me and go, "It's okay, don't worry, you got it." <laughs> well, that was and, <laughs> no, it was bananas, man. And like one of those band members was Niecy Williams. It was crazy. It was nuts. Yeah. So um. And you're like, what? <laughs> <Is that? laughs> so I said, because now I'm starting to think of all these urban legend stories I heard about him, like he's a practical joker. You never know. Sure. You're serious. So I said, are you serious? And he said, of course. I said, well, then would you mind telling my mom? Because I figured you ain't going to lie to mom. So we get to the studio. I call the house, give him the phone. The first voice my mom hears is Stevie Wonder's telling her that he wants to have her son in his band and he's going to take <laughs> care of him and all that. And, you know, they talk for a few minutes and then he hands the phone back to me, and this is what you hear for, for about the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, as, so, as one would. I mean, you know. As one would. As one would. Do, as one would do. So now, that's the front story. And okay. unfortunately, unfortunately, okay, well, this is part of the backstory. The backstory is this. Unfortunately, Ricky did not get the gig. Yes, yeah, I remember you saying that. But, he ended up with Roy Ayers. But now here's the backstory to this. So Ricky uh, um, is there and he auditions and he learns he doesn't get the gig and he walks away from the studio, uh, you know, heart in hand. But then he remembers that he still has my tape. So he goes back to the studio and asks one of the managers there at the time if they would just take this tape because he promised his friend that he would give it to him he's a uh -huh. keyboard player and he just and he said I, if you could just please have him have steve listen to this i promised my friend that i'd get it to him so the guy takes the tape and puts it on a table a pile of other cassettes mm -hmm. he was away at the time but he comes back later and he sits down at this table of cassettes and he just happens to choose mine yeah and he puts my tape in the cassette machine and he's playing and he's listening, and he's listening, and he's listening. And all of a sudden, he stops, he takes the tape out, and he says to the manager, what does this tape say? Mm -hmm. And then the guy says, Greg, said, of course, he butchered my last name. Sure. And then, supposedly, according to what this manager told me years later, he says, this Steve said, okay, get him now. So they call Ricky. <laughs> and Ricky's thinking that he had a change of mind, you know. He's like, <laughs> yes, yes. And and so the guy says, um, no, sorry, but you know, you know your friend. Can you call him? <laughs> so he calls him. And so the legend has it, according to what this manager said, was that Steve wasn't sure if it was him or not. Uh huh. When he was listening to the tape. So that's why he... And I actually told that to Steve a couple of years ago. And I said, does that sound accurate? He goes, oh, okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> so that's the backstory. That's so funny. I'm just imagining, like, Ricky calling you, like, Stevie wants to talk to you. And he's kind of like, you know, because yeah. he didn't get the job. Yeah, um, he, he no, ever... but... He was I mean, so he was so gracious, man. And, and and again, he ended up with Roy Ayers. And then, of course, he did play with Steve uh, later on, and everybody else, you know. Sure, yeah. That's what I, my next question was going to be because I know you know Ricky was an incredible session musician and played with. I saw him play with Steely Dan a couple of times, and um, and I wondered if he had gotten a chance to play with with Stevie at some point. So that's good. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. Okay, so so now you're in Wonderlove. Yeah. Um, and it's at the time where Stevie is working on Songs of Life. Life. Yeah. Um, so, which uh, you had pointed out in, in an interview that he was 25 when he made that record. And I, I hadn't really ever, it's, it's weird with somebody like Stevie because he's just always been there for me. You know, like he's just always been around. <laughs> and you don't think about ages and like... <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, here's here's the perspective. I joined the band just be, a month before my 19th birthday, mm -hmm. and a, month, a month before his 25th. We were one day and six years apart. It's just crazy. And he'd already made four 
timeless records at that point. Yes. I mean, when I was 25, I, you know, what was I do? I wasn't do making timeless records. I can tell you that much (laughs) or 19 for that matter. I mean, like, what was I doing? It's, that's amazing. Um, so you join and you start working on songs of the key of life. What, what's the first track that you work on, um, on the record with him? Man, I don't remember in succession, Daryl. Come on, sure, man. sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can tell you, I can tell you that uh, there were four, and one of them was uh, Saturn. Another one was Joy Inside My Tears. Another one was Isn't She Lovely, and mm-hmm. the other one was Contusion. And the only reason why I'm on Contusion is because in the bridge section with that wildly insane uh, guitar line that Mike Sabello came up with. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stevie couldn't play it. <laughs> but I, could. <laughs> I could. So I said, well, I can play it. So that's, I ended up doubling uh, Michael on, on that, on a synthesizer with that line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know the one you're talking about. It's that da 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 Exactly. Yep, that one. That one. Yeah. I, in fact, it's just a little like trivia that, you know, when you put out that video or Keyscape, you put out that video of you trying out their their soft instrument yeah. and you were talking about contusion and and you said that like because Stevie couldn't play that. I thought to myself, this is the probably one of the only human beings on the face of the earth that can kind of like I mean, kindly, but still, like, kind of trash talk about Stevie a little bit and get away with it. <laughs> and I'm like, I got to talk to him. That's it. Yeah. I gotta- only <laughs> only a little bit, because he only can play every <laughs> Yeah, that's that's incredible. Um, yeah, I, I guess I asked the, the which one you did first, because I in my head I'm imagining, like, you get hired, you go in the studio, and they're like, all right, contusion, here we go. And it's like, oh, my God, what have I got? Yeah. Well, but, I, you know, look, it was it was never any. It was just, like, whatever happened that day. But, sure. um, yeah, there, there were, you know, but th- just priceless moments. Like, I remember working on uh, the strings, the string sounds, or the string parts for Joy Inside My Tears, mm-hmm. and we did it on the giant dream machine, Yamaha. You know the huge mm-hmm. uh, white and chrome, beautiful uh, special edition uh, synthesizer. There's only like three in the world, and something like right. that. Steve has two of them. It's crazy. And um, I remember sitting next to him, side by side, and wagging our heads together, playing <laughs> the string parts to join out my tears. Um, you know, you just can't, you can never uh, put a price on that. I mean, it's just. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't imagine. Um, I was. I was thinking because I was looking through credits and and looking at the songs you were on, and and the one one that stuck out to me a little bit was "Isn't She Lovely?" because yeah. you're the only other person on that song other than Stevie, and so you must have been working together really closely on that one, as opposed to being in a band, you know, like in a in a large band situation. What was that like? Well, it was an overdub, and he said he wanted me to play electric piano, which was really surprising to me because he could have easily done it. But um, sure. it was just wonderful to be part of that, um, and that helped to uh, to cement my relationship with the subject matter, Aisha, because I remember when she was born. I remember mm-hmm. being in New York and hanging out at his brownstone apartment and. Uh, being upstairs and looking down in the crib at her, going, oh, she's cute. <laughs> and now, you know, she's got two kids of her own, and she's uh, all grown up and beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I so, um, what was I thinking about? Um, I get one of the things that I was kind of curious about, especially being that, you know, most of the people that that I know 
aren't going to record in CB Wonder. And given, we as we were talking about how the industry has changed and those sort of like, you know, moving into a studio and recording there for months, that, that doesn't even happen anymore either. What was it? Could you like kind of give us a window into what it was like being a part of the Songs of the Key Life sessions? Like any stories you remember, any anything like that? Man, it's all a blur. Yeah. <laughs> because the thing is, <laughs> one thing about it, uh, you were we were we were all paid on a, on a retainer and uh you know got 500 bucks a week and back then man that was like that was huge money and sure. uh, it was fantastic and we paid regularly regularly but that meant you were on call and when i say on call <laughs> you know i remember many times being asleep and getting a call at no o'clock in the morning saying, all right, you come down to the studio. And not just a local studio. I mean, you know, we we were based in L.A., but many times uh, we would end up in this uh, studio in Irvine, which is in Orange County. Mm-hmm. Um, shoot, I can't remember the name of it. It was a cool studio, but it was a drive, man. And it's like you get a call at uh, one in the morning going, right, so Stevie wants, to, wants you to come to the studio in Irvine. And you're like, all right. <laughs> and then you just, you go down there and you might do something and you might not. Yeah. But it was a hang uh, for sure. And anything could happen at any time. And it was very inspiring and uh, crazy and fun and all of that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was just a wild experience because you'd be hanging out and you'd, Hear him working on stuff, uh, and and you could be asked at any time to participate or not. But mm-hmm. it was just it was just this uh, this this alchemy of of, of uh, ideas and energy, and it was uh, it was great fun. Mm. Did you have any idea at the time as as tracks are going to put together, like, this is really special. This is really going to be something. Um, well, I knew it was special because everybody was waiting on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, we, Steve was driving very crazy, you know, and it got to the point where he had T-shirts, like Steve had T-shirts made that said we're almost finished. <laughs> And and those we wore those for months, but uh, yeah. Um, and, and then it was finally done, and I remember like uh, you know th- this was before uh, social and digital media, and uh, it was a pretty big thing to have a massive billboard in New York near Times Square. And I remember it was this huge wraparound billboard, and it was an ad for Songs in the Key of Life, and they'd never seen anything that big, you know. But that was huge promotion then. Or back then, and it, it was finally released, and uh, everybody, uh, the, the rest of the world came to love what we had been listening to for the past couple of years. That must have been hard to be like, oh, this is so you can't, you just, you don't, you don't understand. This is going to be amazing, you know, like trying to, trying to explain to people what's coming. That must have been amazing, like just a challenge and and awesome at the same time. Yeah, well, I just, well, it's just that you, you felt like you were part of a really cool secret. hmm Yeah, it sounds, like, the story sounds a lot like, you know, things that I'd heard about working for Prince. Like, you know, if you were part of Prince's crew in the studio, that, like, on-call thing, too. Yeah. Like, yeah, he called at four in the morning, and I had to fly to, you know, Minneapolis to go do this thing, and, and that sort of deal. Yeah, that's that's pretty great. Um, yeah, but Prince, Prince was a lot more cruel with it than Steve was. <laughs> Prince call you up. Prince call you up knowing, like he would call you up directly, knowing you were asleep. You were yeah, asleep. just to kind of mess with you, basically. Yeah, yeah no, he was very manipulative. Um, did you? One of the things you you mentioned a little bit earlier is about Stevie being kind of a, a prankster. Did you? Do you have any like memories of anything specific? Not even necessarily to you, but maybe even to somebody else, like stuff that he did to people as a prankster. Yeah, he would call and 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 go in different characters. Like he'd say, right, I'm calling on behalf of, you know, he'd talk like he'd have a British accent. <laughs> That's you know, funny. You no, know, he's nuts. He's nuts. And one thing he did directly to me, I remember we were um, uh, we were still in New York at the Hit Factory. Mm. And 
And, um, you know, you have to remember, I just turned 19. I was all young and cocky and thought I could do everything, whatever, you know. And uh, we were in the studio and we're talking smack. And um, uh, it was my first time trying, um, I think it was Hennessy, like mm-hmm. some really strong liqueur. And I was like uh, trying to be all big and bad. Yeah, I can handle this, you know. And I took several gulps and everything. And uh, and then Steve was also um, a master at floor wrestling. At at what? At floor wrestling. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as well as air hockey, but floor wrestling. And I remember getting on the floor with him, and we wrangled around and wrangled around. And I thought I was, you know hot snot and everything. And then it was time to go. Uh-huh. And, and so we're all leaving. Now, the, the original Hit Factory had only one way to get in and out, and that was this elevator. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think the studio was on, I don't know, I can't remember, maybe the third or maybe the fifth floor or something like that. And you go in and out by this one elevator. So we're all leaving now. A bunch of us are crowding into this elevator with Steve. Mm-hmm. And uh, it probably was higher than a third floor because, you know, on the way down, I remember saying something to the effect of, I don't feel so. And I didn't get the rest of the sentence out before throwing up. Oh, and no. The elevator door opened, and guess who the first person out of the door was? <laughs> Stevie. <laughs> he just ran down. The, he, was, he was gone, man, and everybody was cracking up. Especially Steve, because he wrestled me to the point of, you know, uh, you know, having an upset stomach, and I just threw all that cognac up. Yeah. And uh, so that was a little uh, initiation for me. Felt a little sheepish after that, maybe for the next day. Yeah, a little humbling. <laughs> that air, so air hockey. He's really good at air hockey. I kill you in air hockey, man. Now I have, a, I have a life. Here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, if you ever see Steve with his glasses off, mm-hmm. his eyes uh, tend to just move around uh, uh, uncontrollably. They just move erratically, and, and you know, uh, they just—it's just a natural thing. That's how his eyes tend to. Uh, that's how. That's the movement of his particular uh, eyes. Sure. Um, sure. But when he's focusing on something, all of a sudden they stop and they stay still. Mm-hmm. Which is a little bizarre looking. So when you see him at the under other end of the air hockey table and he's focusing, his eyes stop and they they stop moving and they stay still. So it kind of looks like he's sort of looking at you for a second. Right. It's, it's kind of weird. But man, he will waste you in air hockey because he just you know he's just got that thing. I mean, he can hear where the puck's coming before it gets there. You know. I now, I now have a new sort of like dream in life is yeah. to, is to, to not play him, Steve in air hockey, yeah. play him in air hockey and let him yeah. destroy me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know, and I, I don't want to take too much more of your time. Um, you, you, got, you got 10 minutes. Excellent. That's perfect. Um, do you have a, a, any like particular favorite? I mean, you've given us, a ton of memories. Do you have any like particularly favorite memory with Stevie? Um, you know, maybe even something that's kind of personal or like not without giving anything away or being, you know, like, I don't know, to whatever, but, um, but what, do you have like a favorite Stevie memory? I have millions of them, man. I'm, you know, uh, Oh man. I remember early, early on, um, there was this big, re- I guess it was a release party, big, big party in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And it was either a release party or it was a party, it was, a, it was an after show party, one. And uh, it was New Orleans. And I remember uh, I was in a car with him and we had a police escort. Mm-hmm. And I think that was my first experience of of, of a police escort, and uh, it was pretty cool. And then we get to the place, and then Steve wanted me to walk him in. Mm-hmm. He requested that I walk him in, and, I, and that was very special. Um, that's something that I haven't really shared with anybody. It's just really a personal moment, you know. Um, but then, 
Uh, I have to talk about the profound effect that Songs in the Key of Life has had on me because, you know, uh, you are, you'd be, you'd be very fortunate in your life if you have one full circle moment on anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I've had no less than four full circle moments on just Songs in the Key of Life alone. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the other full circle moments I've had in my career, but just Songs in the Key of Life. Okay, ready? Here okay. we go. So first of all, I record those four songs on, on the album, right? And then, um, years later, uh, at his request, we finally perform the entire record live mm -hmm. for the first time. So that's the first full circle moment. And then the second one is we got to uh, tour that album live, which mm -hmm. was uh the most incredible experience and then the third full circle moment was being music director for tv special honoring that album mm. and then the fourth full circle moment was winning an emmy for the tv show that i did Ugh. as music director so that you know that's just for that album that's amazing. And they, it's just the gift that keeps on giving, basically, you know. Um, wow. Yeah, that would be amazing, especially on the touring end of it, because there's just so much love. You know, I think that was the thing that I walked away from the show I saw a couple of days ago um, is just this like the pouring of love out from the audience. Yeah. And to be, you know, to get caught in the bow wave of that, knowing, you know, knowing that it's 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 for Stevie, but still, you know, just to be a part of that. Um, you, should, you should have been an opening night at the Garden when we did the, the first uh, show of the tour. Yeah. For songs. Man, it was a religious experience. It was everybody just went bananas. Because you got to remember now, this is the first time they're hearing the thing live and the lights go down and the first thing you hear is, Woo! Oh, man. I'm getting goosebumps. People lost their minds. People <laughs> lost their minds. Yeah, that I just, I just literally, I got like a, like a chill up my spine yeah. when you described it. I mean, I wasn't there, and I can imagine. Yeah. Just, oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it would be amazing just to, to experience that, just to be a part of that thing. I mean, it was, it was amazing from an audience perspective, just to feel yeah. that just wave of love. Yeah. So, so, so imagine being me conducting it. Oh, amazing. That's unbelievable. It's it's almost like, well, not almost, it is. Like, those are the moments that make all the struggle worthwhile. You know, all the work that you've done to get to where you are, that it's those little moments yeah. that just kind of like, oh, I'm so glad that I got to do this, that yeah. I had the opportunity and I was given the chance to to do these things. Um, yeah, I can't imagine. A huge um, blessing, a huge blessing. Wow, wow. Well, this is this has been really amazing. Um, I really appreciate this. I'm sure the people that listen to the show really appreciate the stories, and um, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. You too, my good man. And that's our show for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a real privilege to get the opportunity to talk to uh, Mr. Phil and Gaines for a while. I hope that it was as enjoyable for you as it was for me. I really had a great time speaking to him, if you couldn't tell, when I was dorking out there pretty heavily. Uh, the next show, don't know when, don't know who. I hope that's okay. Uh, we're kind of taking things a little fast and loose here at the Year of Living Stevie, uh, but hopefully you'll be along for the ride. Keep your eyes on the Facebook page. That's probably the best place to find information about upcoming shows. If you go to Facebook and search The Year of Living Stevie, uh, you'll be able to find it there, and if you sign up for that, you get a lot of updates and some other cool stuff too. You can also check our webpage, which is theyearoflivingstevie.blogspot.com or also the Abnormal Entertainment homepage. We'll have information there as well. All the links are going to be in the show notes. Uh, if I could ask for something for Christmas, since we're uh, coming up to the holidays here, or you know Hanukkah or whatever it is that you celebrate, uh, I guess one thing I would love to see is I would love to see some reviews on iTunes. That would be really, really cool. If you listen to the show and you like it or whatever the case might be, um, it helps us because the more reviews that we have, the more it kind of gets pushed out 
into people's feeds. If they're into music podcasts, they might want to check that out, and that, that helps us out a lot. So if you could write a review on iTunes, I'm not sure how the Stitcher things works, but I'm Stitcher things. Stitch, bleh, Stitcher thing works. Gosh, that was terrible. Stitcher thing works, but I'm assuming there's probably some way that you can leave um, some feedback there as well that helps us out, makes us, you know, makes us more uh, aware to people um, that uh, might be looking for a podcast like this. So that would be something I would greatly appreciate it. Until next time, Stevie is the truth. Take care, people. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Mr. Stevie Wonder. Head to abnormalentertainment.com for all of our podcasts and blogs. Go to cinemaheadcheese.com for our movie reviews and news. Don't forget our YouTube channels, Abnormal Podcast and Cinema Head Cheese. Get us on Twitter, at Abnormal Podcast. And find all of our shows and Abnormal Entertainment on Facebook. You've been listening to the Abnormal Entertainment Network.